All right, well, if you've noticed here on the corner of the slides during the lyric slides, it had a little 1 plus 1 equals 2 in the corner. And I'm sure you're thinking, it's the weekend. Someone said there'd be no math involved at church. Uh, well, they lied to you, okay? But I, I have some good news with the math. It's simple math, math that even I can do, okay? 1 plus 1 equals 2. Very simple, right? Uh, Nolan is out there in the trailer. He's five years old. And if you give him two apples and you say, here's one apple and here's another apple, if you put them together, how many do you have? And he will tell you there are two apples there, okay? So this is very elementary math that we're talking about. All right. So I have this. I brought a 50-cent piece because it's the biggest coin that I've got. And I wanted everybody to be able to see this. I want you to imagine, if you could, every time you flip this coin, you either get a heads or a tail, right? Well, it's pretty simple math. What are the odds that I would get a head? The odds that I would get a tail? It's 50-50, right? Okay. I tell basketball players all the time, if they're in a shooting slump and they've missed a bunch of free throws or they've missed their last several shots, I'll pull a coin out of my pocket and I'll say, if I flip this 10 times, what are the odds that it lands on heads? And they say, 50-50, and that's right. And I said, well, what if I flip it 10 times and nine times in a row it lands on tails? What are the odds that it's going to land on heads the 10th time? Now, in our brain, we try to factor in all these numbers and the nine, and we make it complicated and all that stuff. But the reality is, every time I flip that coin, whether I do it one time or a bazillion times, there's a 50-50 chance it's going to land on heads. And what has happened before that has no bearing on the next flip of that coin. Does everybody understand that? So I tell that shooter, you may have missed a thousand shots in a row, but this is a brand new shot. This is a brand new flip of the coin. And you got just as good a chance of making this shot as you ever have. And because you've missed all the times before, it has no bearing on this. Does everybody follow that? All right, so we can agree that there's a 50-50 chance if you flip this coin that you get a heads or a tail. Well, I want to talk to you about some pretty simple math because we're all looking for things, things that are simple, things that are a sure thing, right? Turn to Zechariah. While you're in Zechariah, I'm going to take this coin and I'm going to put a cross on it. And I want you to imagine that in this room, We've got so many of these coins that they fill this entire room from that wall to that wall, from that wall to that wall, three feet deep. Okay? That's how many coins we got. And I take this one special coin with a cross on it. All the other ones look just like it, except this one's got a black cross on it. And I take it and I bury it in those coins somewhere and mix them all up real good. And it could be anywhere in this room. How difficult would it be for you to walk into the room and find that one coin? It could take you days, couldn't it? I mean, do you know how many millions of coins we're probably talking about? It'd be three feet deep in here? And I don't know what the square footage and how that equals out, but that's a lot of coins. It would be very, very difficult to find that one special coin. Not impossible, but very difficult, okay? Well, keeping that in mind, let's look at Zechariah. We're in Zechariah chapter 11. All right, let's look at Zechariah chapter 11. Now, I don't want you to think, because we're talking about coins and chances, that we're talking about gambling. Uh, I told the kids last night, we were back there having a, was supposed to be a spades tournament. Now, let me tell you. Normally, the, when we get the youth together, if it's an all-night thing, we have an all-night spades tournament. And I normally don't play. They normally have enough, you know, where they don't need me, and I just, I don't interfere if they got enough. So last night, they needed me. And so me and uh, Juliana are playing Mike and Isaiah. And the game went on for a very long time. You know, it was one of those defensive struggles. And eventually, me and Juliana won. And our next opponent was supposed to be Noah and Samuel. And, of course, after we won, Noah says, well, it's 3 o'clock. I think we're going to bed. I think he just feared playing me and Juliana, the truth be known. 
But I told the kids last night while we were playing, I said, you know, there's a lot of people that if they were to walk into a church and they saw you playing cards, they would say, ooh, heathens, hypocrisy. They've brought curses onto the church because your parents or your grandparents always have associated cards with gambling. But when you play goldfish, or go fish, told you I didn't get much sleep last night. When you play go fish, you're not gambling. When you play solitaire, you're not gambling. When you play gin rummy with a friend or uh, pick a favorite card game, hearts or spades or whatever, you're not gambling, right? It's just a card game. It's just a fun game. And so I told him last night, I said, if an old person would walk into this church from back in the day, they'd say, oh, I can't believe those kids are playing cards at church. But nobody was wagering anything uh, except, um, I do need the title of that Mustang, Sam, when you get a chance. So let's, let's look at Zechariah, and uh, let's talk about finding that little coin. And we're in Zechariah chapter 11. Now, we got an Easter egg hunt coming up, right? Easter egg hunt. We normally hide, how many eggs did we hide last year, Trish? Do you have a clue? Hundreds? Hundreds? If we, just, if we had 100 eggs and we had one golden egg, pretty simple math, right? The chances of you finding one out of that 100 would be one in 100. And if we told you, come in here and find the golden egg, it's one of 100, you've got a one in 100 chance, right? All right, let's look at Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 11, starting in verse 12. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it to them in, and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Now you notice in verse 13, he says, Take those 30 pieces of silver and cast them into the potter, for that is the price at which they priced me. What's God talking about? Well, if you remember, Judas got 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ. That was the pay. They said, if you'll lead us to where we can arrest him. See, they were worried about the crowds. They didn't want to arrest Jesus during the day because he had thousands of followers, and they, would, they were afraid it would start a revolt. They wanted to go to him in the secrecy of the night and arrest Jesus under the cover of darkness. And so Judas said, I tell you what, I can hook you up. I can take you to where he is, away from the crowds. You can sneak in and get him and arrest him. And they said, well, if you'll do it, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. And you 30 pieces of silver, that's a, that's a lot of money. Today, uh, if you have an ounce of silver, that's worth about 30 bucks. So if those little pieces were just one ounce, and today's money, you're talking about almost 1,000 bucks that they were giving him. If they were more than an ounce, you could be talking about thousands of dollars, okay? So either way you slice it, it was a pretty good chunk of change to betray Christ. And they give him these 30 pieces of silver. Now this Zechariah verse is hundreds of years before Christ is even born. And God tells Zechariah, he says, take 30 pieces of silver and throw it to the potter because that's what they're going to price me at. 30, price, 30 pieces of silver. This is a prophecy of Jesus being crucified arrested and betrayed for the price of 30 pieces of silver and then he says when that happens throw it to the potter if you know the story of Judas Judas had these 30 pieces of silver and after he had betrayed Christ and saw what they were doing to him he felt guilty he felt bad he thought man what's going to happen to me Jesus even told him what's going to happen to the person who betrays Christ is really bad and so he knows doom and gloom is coming on him. So if you know the story of Judas, he takes his 30 pieces of silver and he throws it to the potter's field, puts himself in a tree, hangs himself in that tree. He gets hung, the tree branch breaks, and he falls off the cliff into the potter's field. And it fulfills the prophecy that 30 pieces of silver would be used to betray Christ and that that 30 pieces of silver would be used to buy the potter's field. And it's told hundreds of years in advance in Zechariah. 
Now, what are the chances that God could say hundreds of years in advance, they're going to put 30 pieces of silver as the price on my head, and it's going to pay for the potter's field? And then hundreds of years later, that's exactly what happens to this man named Jesus. There's probably a pretty good chance that if that happened to Jesus, he is the Son of God that this is prophesying about. Can we agree to that? Now, maybe, maybe it could have been somebody else. Maybe it could have been more than one person that this happened to. But we know that it specifically happened to Jesus. And for a prophecy to happen hundreds of years in advance, so detailed, to fall into place exactly the way God says it's going to happen, it's kind of like walking in that room three feet deep in coins and finding that one. The chances of it being Jesus that the 30 pieces were sold to, to turn Jesus in, prophesied hundreds of years in advance, the odds are about the same as finding this coin in that room three feet deep, okay? Scientists did the math on that, and they said that it would be a one with 17 zeros behind it would be the chances of that prophecy being fulfilled by the wrong person. Not impossible, but very close, okay? Now let's look at Let's look at Isaiah 7. As you're flipping to Isaiah 7, I want you to imagine you're coming in here for the Easter egg hunt and it's let's say it's rain, so we've had to hide the Easter eggs in here and there's a 100 of them and one of them's the golden egg. And we tell you, as an adult, the rest of the kids are going to be, how old are the kids doing the Easter egg hunt? Five, fifth grade and younger? Okay, so you're up against fifth graders and younger, all right? And we tell you, you're the only adult that gets to come in the room and try to find the golden egg. And inside that golden egg is a bazillion dollars. And you're like, well, I got a, I got a pretty good chance. First of all, it's only one in a hundred. Secondly, I'm the only adult in the room. There's a bunch of little kids. One of them gets in my way, I'll knock them down. If I see one of them reaching for the golden egg, I'll take it out of their hand, right? I got a pretty good chance. And then we tell you, we're going to blindfold all the kids, but not you. You're thinking, hey, my chances of finding this golden egg are pretty much a sure thing now, right? And aren't we always looking for a sure thing? If somebody could come to you and say, look, I can tell you right now who's going to win the NCAA championship. And if you'll put, here's a million dollars here, I'm going to give it to you. If you'll put this million dollars on them, you'll double your money or triple your money or quadruple your money or whatever. And they could guarantee you that that was going to happen. In fact, they said, if I'm not right, you can keep that million dollars yourself. You get to keep it. I'll pay you a million dollars. Who in this room would not do that? I'd do it, right? Sounds like a sure thing to me, doesn't it? I've often thought, if they ever invented time travel, which they won't, but if they did, the first thing I would do, I would go back and put money on the Super Bowl champions of the 80s and the 90s. So that when I got married, I'd be a bazillionaire, right? If you knew ahead of time it's a sure thing, wouldn't you do it? Aren't we looking for that sure thing? If we said, come into the Easter egg hunt, the kids will be blindfolded, but not you. If you find the golden egg, you get a bazillion dollars. I'd be like, sign me up. What do I have to do? Do I have to wear bunny ears? Because I'll do it. If somebody said, here's a million dollars, I can guarantee you what's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, I'll give you another million. Sign me up. I like a sure thing. I don't think I'm the only one. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. Now we all know this talking about Mary and baby Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Scientists did the math on this and they said the chances of Zechariah being fulfilled by the wrong person and those 30 pieces of silver would be like that coin in this room. Then they said, if you add the virgin birth prophecy to it, then the chances of it being anybody besides Jesus, 
take this room three feet deep full of coins and expand that three feet deep from here to the sun and back. Three feet deep all the way to the sun, all the way back. Now go find that one coin in it. Impossible. If you searched every day for the rest of your life, you wouldn't find it. There's not enough time. And those two prophecies alone in the Bible tells us mathematically it's impossible for anyone else besides Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and the Messiah. He fulfilled those two prophecies alone and no one else did. Now there are hundreds of prophecies in the Bible and every time you add one of those prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, the chances of it being somebody besides Jesus as the Messiah increase. So then it's not just to the Son and back, it's to as far as you can imagine and back. And further and further and further. You might could find this coin in this room, but you could not find this coin if it stretched out to eternity and back. And that's pretty much the odds of somebody being the Messiah other than Jesus Christ based on Scripture and the simple math of, well, could it have been Duncan? Well, no, he wasn't born of a virgin birth. Mark him out. Who do we know born of a virgin birth other than Jesus? Who do we know that was sold for 30 pieces of silver other than Jesus? Check the historical documents. Pull up the scribes from the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Just those two prophecies alone fulfilled by Jesus to perfection prove that he's the Messiah. All right, let's look in uh, Psalms 22. One more thing. Psalm 22, verse 14. And we've talked about this in here before because it covers so much ground. Psalm 22, verse 14. And we're going to read through 18. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of, the, of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. Now, if you don't know who this is talking about yet, God bless you. Here comes the giveaway. Here's the spoiler. They have pierced my hands and my feet. It's pretty obvious who this is talking about, right? I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. Don't you know they surrounded the cross and mocked Jesus? Isn't that what Scripture says? They divide my garments among them. Didn't they, didn't they gamble to see who was going to get his robe? And they cast lots for my clothing. Isn't that what, isn't that what happened? Well, the funny thing about that is, this is Psalms about 700 years before Christ was born. This was written. God bless you. 700 years before Christ was born, he said, they're going to put me on a cross. I'm going to hang there. My mouth is dry. What did Jesus say on the cross? I thirst. And they dip the sponge and hyssop and put it in his mouth. That's what Scripture says 700 years later. It says right here in Psalms that they'll cast lots. They'll, they'll gamble for my clothes to see who gets to keep what. And it says 700 years later in the Gospels that they gambled for the clothes of Jesus to decide who got what. We could go through the entire Old Testament and pull out hundreds of prophecies that are clearly about Jesus Christ that only Jesus Christ has fulfilled. And when you do the math, it's pretty simple. If you're looking for a sure thing, it's not this coin. It's not searching for a golden egg. If you're looking for a sure thing, it's Jesus. Man, we go through our whole life looking for a sure thing. If I just knew for sure, I would. Man, if I could just know. I mean, how do you know? How do you know that you know? You know, people say, well, you'll know when you're in love. How will you know when you're in love? Because you'll know that you know. Well, that's kind of circle reasoning, but okay. I think everybody here that's been in love before knew it, or at least can look back and say, you know what, I was in love. 
but don't we hunger and thirst for a sure thing? Well, forget about the million dollars. What if I came up to you and said, hey, guess what? Gold and silver, I have none. But eternal life, I got a sure thing for you. The moment you take your last breath on this earth, I can assure you that you're going to wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ, God Almighty, all your Christian relatives that died before you. You're going to be with them in paradise forever. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more dying, no more getting old, no more babies getting sick. Perfect paradise. A sure thing. Do you want it? And we've got it. The simple math tells us. One with 17 zeros is the chances of somebody fulfilling Zechariah other than Jesus. One with 157 zeros when you include this Psalms prophecy. You can't count the amount of zeros that goes behind the one if you talk about all the prophecies that Christ fulfilled. Man, we got a sure thing. But what happens? What are the odds that we'll receive Christ? What are the chances? Because not everybody does, right? The Bible says that the path to heaven is the gates are straight and narrow. Few will find it. But it talks about the gates of hell being wide and many there. Why? We would never pass down or pass up a 100% guaranteed $1 million. If somebody came to you and says, if you can tell me your favorite color, I will give you this brand new car. Blue. Right? Sure thing. Where's the keys? I don't care what kind of car it is. If I don't like it, I'll sell it. Right? I have Darren soup it up for me. I'll have Tom tenant, and I'll sell it for more than it's worth. Right? It's a sure thing. But if somebody comes to us and says, I've got something that's going to keep you out of hell. You're going to have eternal life with Jesus Christ and God in heaven. Do you want it? Well, you know, I've got to get some things right in my life first. I just don't know. I mean, I've heard all that Jesus stuff, and I've gone to church my whole life, and I'm a good person, and I like church and all that, but I don't know if I'm ready to, you know, be that Christian, you know, like a Jesus freak kind of person. I mean, I, I believe the Bible, and I believe there's a God. Well, Satan believes the Bible. He quoted it to Jesus. I guarantee you Satan believes there's a God, because when God said, Satan, come here, you know what he did? Yes, sir. So what it says in the book of Job. And Job, two times it says, uh, this probably happened more than that, but we're told specifically twice in the book of Job, God said, all the angels, even the fallen ones, come here. And he asked Satan, he said, where you been? And Satan says, I've, I've been walking to and fro in the earth. He didn't say, ain't none of your biswax. He didn't say, I'm not telling you. He didn't say, I got the invitation to show up to your throne, but I'm not coming. I don't want to. Jesus said, come here. And he said, yes, sir. He said, where you been? Well, I've been in the earth. And he asked him questions, and Satan answered, because he is under the authority of God Almighty. And we are given something, a sure thing, that puts us right there with God, with his authority in our life above the enemies. And we say, eh. And then maybe we do receive Christ, and we do become Christians. But do we share it with anybody? That person that you're going to see at work tomorrow that you know is not a Christian, especially if you look at the fruits of their life, and if somebody would say, do you think they're a Christian? <laughs> Are you kidding me? More like a Nazi. Right? We all know people like that. That if we had to decide one or the other, are they Hitler fans or are they Christians? We'd say, oh, it's got to be Hitler because I know they don't like Jesus. I was riding my bike one day. Y'all want to come up? Where's it? Where's it? Y'all want to come up and do this last one? I was riding my bike one day, and uh, you know I've told you before that people like to get right beside of you sometimes and see if they can scare you. And you know I used to be that guy until I started biking, and then I was like, man, that's rude. You know that's dangerous. <laughs> you get a little different perspective, right? And so I'm riding my bike one day, and I've got on my Jesus Freak outfit, you know, and it says Jesus Freak on the back, and it's got a Bible verse, and. Whenever a car comes by, I throw my hand up. You know, I don't know who it is, and I don't know uh, how fast they're going or any of that stuff, but I can hear them coming. I th just throw up my hand to be nice if I can. And so I hear a car coming, and you can tell it's an older car. I've got headphones in, and I can still hear the car, so it's got muffler issues and that kind of stuff. And it's, it's catching up with me, and I throw my hand up, 
And a lot of times, you know, if somebody's nice, you'll see them throw their hand up in the rearview mirror to you, or they'll get real wide and give you plenty of room and all that kind of stuff. Well, this guy, he's in like a 1982 Ford pickup, you know, and he's, wah, 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 and he just goes right by me. And I mean, he's just right on my handlebars. I'm like, ooh, you know. And I look up to see, you know, who it is, where he's going, what's going on, you know, just trying to register everything in my mind. And the dude's shooting me the rod out the back of his car, and he's got another guy on the passenger side. And as he's got his middle finger up at me, he says, uh, F you, is what he said, you know, so he didn't abbreviate anything. And I, my first thought was, oh, I got on a Jesus shirt. I know he saw my Jesus shirt. And I was like, you know what? First of all, he was probably ticked off that I was on a bike, because that ticks off a lot of motorists. But more importantly, he probably did see that shirt. And he was bitter. He had some hate. And when he saw Jesus on the back, I'm lucky he didn't run over me, right? Maybe he thought about that too. But we all work with that guy that would run over you if he, if he could get away with it, right? We all know that person. But we got a sure thing that we can share with them to change them. And look, you might be sitting there thinking, well, you can't change them. You don't know, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, didn't Jesus change you? If he can change me, if he can have me crying at a concert because my daughter's worshiping Jesus, there is hope for you. I promise you. You know, Paul said, of all these sinners, I'm the least of. He could say that because I had not been born yet. If Paul was born today and was preaching today, he would say, of all the sinners out there, I'm the worst. Well, there's Duncan, and then there's me, and then there's the rest of you sinners. Look, if I can get it, if I can receive that sure thing, anybody can. You have not done anything where Christ would say, can't help you. It's a sure thing for everybody else, but not you. That's a lie from the devil. And if you know somebody that needs Jesus, and you're like, well, I don't know what I'd say to them. They're so far gone. That's a lie, too. You're just being chicken. You're afraid what they're going to say because they're a little bit cray-cray. You got to tell them about Jesus. What if you get before the throne of God and he looks at us and says, I put that person there at your workplace, at your school, at your whatever, so that you would share that sure thing with them and you didn't do it. You were their one chance, the one in a bazillion, to find me. You were their one chance and you didn't even try. What are we going to say? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you that you fulfilled all Scripture, that you are the living Word of God, that you came to do those things, to fulfill the Scripture, to die for us, to be rose again, because you love us and you want us to have a relationship with you. And Lord, it's simple. You are holy and true, and we have sinned and have been separated from you because of our sin. And your actions on the cross and your resurrection allow us to add us back to you again. And it's that simple. So if somebody in here doesn't know you, Lord, we would just pray that they would say to you right now, Lord, I don't know you. I feel like I've been going to church for a long time and I, I know all the stories and I believe in you, but I've never asked you to come into my heart. The best way I know right now, Lord, I just say, come into my heart and save me. If there's somebody listening online, they're like, well, you know, I've heard this before and I've heard about this Jesus thing and I wasn't sure, but now I know it's a sure thing and I want it. Come into my heart and save me, Lord. If there's somebody listening online or in here right now that's been a Christian for a long time, but they haven't shared that sure thing, the good news of the gospel with those around them, that they would just say, all right, Lord, use me. I don't know what to say, how to say it. I don't know a lot about the Bible. I don't know the words you'd want me to say. I don't even know if these people will listen to me, but I am willing to go if you'll send me. And so give me your words, give me your spirit, give me your wisdom, and I ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Duncan Davis at Impact Church. Thank you for listening today. We hope and pray that today's message has impacted your life for Christ. We pray that you'll impact others' lives for Christ. Come and fellowship with us at Impact Church on Sunday mornings at 1030. Have a great day and God bless you.